On the Spot with Michelle McCorry is brought to you by Prime XBT. Hello, I'm Michelle McCorry. Thank you for joining us. Going into 2023, bearish sentiment was extremely high, with concerns of a recession and an aggressively hawkish Fed. But so far, equity markets have defied those expectations. The S&P 500 is up over 15% year-to-date, and the Nasdaq is up almost 33%. Well, my next guest called that correctly. He forecasts that we would see a rally this year, and he called the market bottom in October of 2022. And now he is forecasting that the U.S. stock markets will have a big final push higher of at least 36% from current levels in what he calls a parabolic melt-up before then crashing in a global deflationary downturn that could possibly be the worst financial crisis in history. David Hunter is the chief macro strategist at Contrarian Macro Advisors. He has had a long career on Wall Street with 25 years of investment management experience and 20 years as a sell side strategist working at companies like Fidelity and The Hartford. And his recent correct calls include forecasting an equity rally in March of 2020, when sentiment was extremely bearish in the height of the pandemic. And he also said that oil would fall to around $60 in 2022, following the Russian conflict with Ukraine. He also then predicted that oil would rise to around the $80 level. And as I mentioned, he correctly called the so-called bear market rally that we are seeing now. David, very good to have you with us. Welcome to Kitco. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Nice to see you. Great to have you with us. As I just touched on, you have had a number of very correct calls. Did I miss any there? Um, the oil's a little confusing because I, I did um, at 1.30 when it ran up during the, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I did at, at 130 say we'll probably get back to 85 and of course at that time most most of the strategists and analysts were calling for 150 to 200 it took a while to get there and i was kind of chastised for being bearish when everybody was bullish oil um but it, once it went to below 100 then i called the uh, move down to 60. so just to clarify a little bit um it was you know it was kind of in two steps to get to that 60 forecast Right. Got it. That was just an overview there. And again, you're being a contrarian with your calls. And so you also got a lot of uh, challenges when you said in March of 2020 that we're going to have a bull market. Expand on that for us a little. Sure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if everybody can remember March of 2020, the vast majority of people thought we were heading below 2000. Uh, you know, they were calling for a, a drawn out bear market. And I said, not only are we going to reverse here, we're going to reverse sharply and head up to new highs, something uh, above 4,000. And then from there, I raised my estimates to uh, 4,500 and ult ultimately uh, uh, 5,300. So we didn't get quite up to 5,300. But um, yeah, I was I was a bull in a, among an awful lot of bears at that time. Yeah. Well, needless to say, you've had, as I mentioned, a contrarian approach, but your forecasts have turned out to be very, very accurate. And we're going to get your forecasts for the markets, for oil, for gold, for silver, a lot of other commodities in the near term and in the longer term. But I want to start with breaking down your overall macro thesis. You are forecasting extreme volatility, saying we have a huge run in the market, potentially taking the S&P to 7,000. Uh, given that we have too much leverage in the system, however, combined with Fed over tightening the most non forward looking Fed, as you put it, that we've ever seen, that is all going to cause a hard landing, a global deflationary bust, an 80 percent bear market, a terrible recession. But that then leads to a huge commodity super cycle and that all of this plays out by the end of the decade. Is that a fair summary? Yes, that's a good summary. Um, it's it's a, it sounds rather schizophrenic, um, but it really has to do with the fact that we're um, very late in a super cycle, and I define a super cycle as the big cycle between two depressions 
the 1930s and what I think will be a depression in the 2030s. So we're in the pretty much the last stages or the last decade of that. And uh, combine that with a, par uh, with a pandemic, you've got a, a fragility there. You've got um, massive intervention on the part of governments and central banks. And it leads to this kind of volatility, which is typical at the end of a super cycle anyway. All right. So let's now break down the stages here. That's the overall thesis. Again, we're going to get your forecasts of various asset classes along the way. So stage one, we have markets melting up, as you call it, over the next few months, call, causing a rally in the S&P 500 to levels between 6,000 and 7,000 this year. You're forecasting that the Nasdaq will hit 20,000 this year. You're also predicting a rally in bonds with the 10-year yield falling to 0% and the 30-year yield falling to 0.5%. So break that down for us. Break that down for us. How do we get here? How does this all happen? Sure. Um, the first stage, obviously, is the melt, so-called melt-up. And you're seeing a lot of people out there talking about a melt-up now. Um, I'm not saying I coined the phrase, but I think I was probably responsible for an awful lot of people picking up the term that was not used a lot prior to this past year. And um, I call melt up something that is highly unusual. What I see on on the street these days is an awful lot of investors and pundits using the term melt up and then saying, you know, a 200 point rally. That is not a melt up. That's just a nice rally. I mean, we've had a nice rally here in the last couple of weeks, but it's not a melt up. Um, I think the melt up kicks in after we go to new highs. Um, my guess is, you know, we run up here to maybe 4650 and back off and then make an, another run. But the, the whole reasoning behind it, it's, it's the hardest part uh, for investors to grasp. They could they could buy into a bust up until recently uh, because they could see that the Fed was tightening and that the economy was in trouble. Uh, there were a lot of signs that we had, um, you know, big issues out there, a lot of excesses. But they had trouble understanding how, you know, they said, hey, we made our top in 2021. Why do you think we're, you know, what makes you so sure we're going to go to higher highs and not only higher highs, but substantially higher highs? And it comes down to, as I am, as you said, I'm a contrarian. Sentiment plays a big role in my work. And you had last year, uh, in my 50 years, I don't think I've seen very many times where we've had such a consensus of investors on one side, meaning in this case, the bearish side. And so it was pretty easy to see that at some point, we were going to get a very big move in the other direction. And I think we're just beginning that now. There's still an awful lot of, I'd say, the vast majority of investors still viewing this as a bear market rally. So, yes, they're expanding their upside, but they still believe it ends in ends badly and ends in something, um, before we get to new highs, ends in something that goes to new lows. Uh, I think before this is over, you will see almost all of that bearishness um, in capitulation and having to reposition bullishly. Um, as you know, uh, institutional investors can, can stay on the sidelines for just so long, and then all of a sudden performance pressures come in, and they can't stay. I mean, obviously shorts have that issue, but any, any even long-only portfolios can't just sit out a market that's starting to move higher. And I think we're at that breaking point now. You're seeing more and more firms raising their equity allocations. Again, it's very early. They're just starting. And sell-side strategists are raising their allocation equities, all just starting. And I think what's ahead in, in the summer months and maybe into the early fall is, is that movement from defensive to more offensive um, investing. All right. So it sounds like you're saying that basically FOMO is going to kick in here, fear of missing out. And if, if you're a hedge fund and the S&P is up 15 percent year to date, you've got your client saying, hey, what the heck? You know, why am I missing out on all this action and all the money that's on the sidelines is going to come flooding in? And you say once we hit 4650, that's the trigger that all of this money on the sidelines really comes flooding in? 
Actually, I think there's a setup. And again, it could either just push through that. I think the the, the real money push comes after new highs, so above 4,800. But I do believe there's a setup where we might see it run to 4,650 and pull back as much as 10% before we go. Okay. I don't have high conviction on that, but I think that's a potential setup. So we may, you know, we may spend a few weeks on the downside before we go because we're pretty overbought now. And we've certainly in the very short run had an awful lot of movement towards the bullish side. So from a trading perspective, I think, you know, we've seen a shift from a longer term investment perspective. I still say the majority, the vast majority are bearish. Um, Okay, so give me your upside targets for this current phase, for the melt-up, the parabolic melt-up phase, your upside targets for the S&P, uh, for the NASDAQ, for the Dow, for the Russell. What, what are those? Okay, my, my S&P target is six to 7,000. Um, I think, uh, and people, you know, people try to challenge and say, oh, maybe it'll even go higher than that. I said, that's you know, my visibility beyond that is, is impossible. You know, once you go into a parabolic, it can go wherever it would like uh, in a very short time, but I think six to seven thousand captures the, you know, pretty much the probability, um, and that's a wide range. But that's because that we're we're going to be in a vertical parabolic blow off, um, you know, very very euphoric blow off. Um, on the Nasdaq, I am looking for twenty thousand. That looked pretty crazy not very long ago, but. Given you know the AI euphoria here, and I've taken a look at a lot of individual charts, and I can see an awful lot of stocks that not very long ago I it was hard to see new highs. I can see major new highs in a lot of major tech stocks, etc. So you know the semiconductor index is almost back to its all-time high. So I mean we're I think there's going to be a breakout to new highs in a lot of these. Um, stocks and also in the average. So, any, 20, any in particular there? Just to interrupt you, any particular yeah, tech, high, as tech a, stocks that you see new highs in? As a macro strategist, I got to stay away from individual names, but okay. I can talk sectors. I think um, the semiconductors uh, are going to be lead the way. I have, I had a target of four hundred on the SMH before it split two for one, so two hundred on the. You know, post split, um, I've just raised that to 250, which would in the previous pre split be 500. That's a big run. I mean, it's well beyond the old highs. Yeah, um, sure. I think so, industrials will have a nice run. I think um, the um, commodities will, you know, the XLB uh, will go on to new highs. Um, I think home builders surprisingly are going to show significant new highs. Um, so there's a lot of groups and a lot of cyclical groups. As you know, um, we've had a narrative out there for a little while here that, um, you know, this is a, a poor quality rally that it's all based on AI and a few tech stocks. Right. Um, below the surface, if you look, that's not really a true statement. You know, a lot of groups are not far off their highs and it's not all AI. I mean, it's some like, the industrial index is really not very far away. Uh, home builders have had a 50% run since the bottom. So there's a lot of groups that are both up and poised for a lot higher. Uh, what, so, what, what does gold do during this rally phase, David? Um, sure. Gold, Let me, silver. Uh, just to finish out, because I kind of jumped around, um, my, my target on the Dow is 48,000. My uh, melt-up target on the Russell is 3,000. So I do think small caps are going to have a big catch-up rally as well. Um, as, in terms of gold and silver, I'm very bullish. Um, I think they, they've they obviously been disappointing and they've taken their time coming. But they have bottomed and they've had a secondary um, correction. And I think they're about to emerge from that secondary correction here. And ultimately... Um, probably will top out after the index, after the equity indexes, but not that far after, uh, and still be early in the bust or pre-bust. Um, my targets are gold to three thousand pre-bust and silver to sixty pre-bust. So again, big big moves, um, and people have soured on them obviously quite a bit because of their 
their um, laggard performance. Right. Okay. So firstly, what timeline do you see this parabolic melt-up happening over? What is the time frame pre-bust? Yeah, I've been saying, and I'm guilty of this. I mean, if anybody wants to uh, go on Twitter, they'll find plenty of critics um, because because it is a melt up. It will happen in a short period of time, and uh, you know consolidations come and stretch everything out. So I thought it could have happened last year, and it got stretched out. I'm I'm basically saying we'll probably see most of the melt up move um, by the end of the summer, which means could be Labor Day, but it could stretch into September. Um, could it stretch beyond that? Of course, but that's kind of my best guess right now. Um, as I keep saying, consolidations that last for a month or two just stretch the scenario out for a month or two. So, so there's no magic to that. I'm not trying to time it precisely. It's it's the end of a 41-year uh, secular bull market. I date the secular bull back to August of 1982. And I do that, a lot of people try to date it back to 2008-9. Um, I use 1982 because that's really when uh, the um, disinflation trend began and interest rates peaked out. So you've had this long run of PE multiples expanding in inversely to the drop in interest rates. So, you know, 10-year rates went from 15% down to almost zero. PE multiples went from single digits up to, you know, market multiple to mid 20s. So that's that's to me all one secular bull market. We've had several cyclical bull markets within that. And I think this is the culmination of that 41 year bull market. And that 41 year bull market starts to uh, come to an end more or less by the end of the summer, by October of this year. I think so. And, right. and, and I think the highs of this bull market will not likely be seen again for decades. Not a decade, but decades. The equity highs. The equity highs. You have yeah. a different outlooks on commodities, which we'll get to. Yeah, com commodities very different. Precious metals very different. Yeah, we, we, we'll get to that. But while we're talking about precious metals, why would gold and silver do well in this current rally, because they don't necessarily tend to do well when the rest of the equity market is, is rallying along. So why would this parabolic melt up also bring gold and silver up with it? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would go back to the 2001 to 2011 period. And we obviously had in, within that period a very um, large equity rally. And we also had a very large precious metal rally. So it can happen. I know history does point to lots of times when press smells go opposite to the equity markets, but not always. And I think what's going to probably be a driving element here is uh, uncertainty, certainly. Um, maybe maybe crypto is not going to be uh, a place to run, uh, or certainly not the conviction run that it was last, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, and and I do I do have a very bearish view on the dollar in for the balance of this year. So um, I think that's going to be a big play a big role as well. Uh, and of course we have we have kicking around. It's not going away yet. Um, the worries about inflation and precious metals can can play a role there as well. Okay, and you forecast another rate hike for the Fed. Within. I, I I always say I don't I don't try to forecast what the Fed's going to do. Um, I my my rate forecasts are based on what I see market wise. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of people out there that think the Fed controls rates. I go they control the overnight rate. They don't control you know ten and thirty year rates. They don't control the bond market. So um, I think it's very it's it's possible you'll see a, a hike in July, and I think it's very possible that we'll see if we get my scenario in equities, I think it's very possible when we get to 6,000 or above that Powell's going to be pushing for rate hikes because um, I, as I've said many times, Bill Dudley's speech in April of 2022 saying that it was very important to get the equity market down um, to uh, as a part of tightening financial conditions and that that would be a requisite for um, you know, getting inflation down, 
Powell bought, bought that hook, line, and sinker, uh, you know, right after that speech. And you saw all of last year, every time the market lifted its head, out came many governors trying to jawbone it down. He, uh, he sort of abandoned that strategy in early 2023 because it wasn't working. The market was moving up. When these guys came out, it wasn't driving the market down. The market continued to move on its own. Um, I think the meeting this past week, um, you saw a, a similar strategy, but through a different method. I think their hawkish talk about two more rate hikes and, you know, still feeling like there's more tightening and it's going to stay high. Rates are going to stay high for a long time. I think a lot of that was aimed at the stock market. They and it was also they didn't want the market taking the pause and running with it. So I think they used that to kind of counter the pause and try to jawbone the market lower, or at least not you know, keep it from going higher. I think it'll fail. I'm very critical of, of both Dudley and Powell for this. I think the Fed is um, hugely making an error in targeting the stock market. Um, you know, Alan Greenspan, Alan Greenspan proved long ago that uh, you know the Fed is not great at deciding where the stock market should be. You know, the rational exuberance uh, speech was many years before the market topped out. And um, and as I say, not only is it not they're not in their bailiwick and not in their abilities to um, decide where the market should be or, or to do it well, um, by doing so, by deciding that they're targeting the market in some form, they're taking away one of their most important leading indicators. Stock market's a much better predictor of the future than is uh, the FOMC, frankly. So even with another rate hike and even with the Fed trying to signal that it's going to continue with its tightening, you still see the markets, as we said, rallying to new uh, all-time highs by roundabout October of 2023. Yeah, because actually what I think, and again, it could go several different directions. I could be wrong that the economy continues to soften here, but I think we're seeing signs that we're moving towards recession and ultimately bust. So I'm not so sure the Fed's going to hike rates in the next, you know, this summer. What I'm saying is that you you could have a pause that lasts more than a month. It might last for a few months. It's it's when the market, when the melt-up is almost finished. It's when the mar- we're in the last weeks of it that the Fed may mistakenly say, you know, more than more than the economy, more than anything else, the stock market's his concern because it's runaway risk, and he may come back and tighten then and say we're we're hiking a half a point or whatever um, because we see you know an elevated stock market uh, you know with again with that uh, message from Bill Dudley in his ear, uh, and I would call that a big error because I think it will be on the eve of a bust. So. At that point, the Fed over tightens. And is that what sends us into this global deflationary bust? Because you're saying following this rally in bonds and stocks, you know, that's what we can expect, an immense bust. Um, how do we go from this bullish market sentiment to this global economic downturn? Is that because the Fed is not forward looking and doesn't take into account that it may have already tightened too much and that there may not be enough liquidity in the markets. What what takes us to this big bust? What's the trigger? Sure. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, the Fed gives a lot of lip service to the variable leads and lags or the variable lag to policy, but they don't show that they really understand it because they're still data driven. They're still looking at, uh, by definition, data that is backward looking and they're wanting to see 2% inflation or something very close to that before they stop. If, if the lags are six, nine, 12 months, they've probably already gone too far. And I do think they've gone too far and they're tightening. And, and like I said, they could go further. So I think a lot of it is that lead and lag that's a problem. And so, therefore, way over tightening. And again, we're focused. I'm focused on the U.S., but it's true around the world. You know, ECB is doing the same thing. Bank of England, 
uh, Bank of Canada, um, Bank of Australia is kind of taking a step back for a second. But but ultimately, I think all the central banks are going to be guilty of not understanding that variable lag and going too far. Um, so that's a big part of it, is a huge policy area, error um, globally. Secondly, we had a pandemic um, that led to unprecedented uh, stimulus, unprecedented um, reaction. And I think that's throwing a lot off because we've got $5 trillion that went in from the Fed. Um, central banks around the world did similar. Um, we had all kinds of programs uh, fiscally. And it's, it's making it more confusing from a jobs picture, uh, from a spending picture. The consumers still got savings. The savings rate come way down, but savings is still there. So it's, it's kept this cycle going when, you know, policy by now would have probably shown uh, a lot more downside. But um, so they're looking and saying, well, the economy is pretty good. No, it isn't. It's fragile. It's just kind of um, the signals are being messed up by, by the pandemic. So I think the fragility brought in by the pandemic, of course, we, you know, we saw an awful lot of changes in our economy through those two or three years. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of not focused on either by the Fed or by most people. There is a lot more fragility going into this down cycle than I think we've seen in the past. Um, so it's that. And then the biggie is the leverage. You've got $300 trillion in global debt, and that's up $50 trillion in just a couple of years because of the pandemic um, move. So, uh, you know, $50 trillion in a couple of years, I don't think we wrap our arms around that very well and understand it. Um, but $300 trillion globally in debt, and then, of course, quadrillions in notional value of derivatives, and that's leverage on the markets, uh, all kinds of markets. So the combination of those two forms of leverage, we're at levels we have never been at before. No down cycle have we entered with anything close to this kind of leverage. And so we're in uncharted territory. Uh, you, you know, As I say, the formula is really economic fragility caused by the pandemic, plus uh, a potentially the biggest policy error in history uh, from central banks, and, and plus... Um, that leverage, and you've got a formula for it takes it takes a normal recession into something far worse. All right, so we've got this extraordinary excessive leverage throughout the system, and basically central banks around the globe over tightening. How is it? And we'll talk about the global picture here. How is it that all of the central banks, or the majority of the central banks, get this so wrong? Is it because, like you said, the data is skewed from the pandemic? They, they're not adjusting models? Like These are, in theory, supposed to be smart, uh, economically savvy people. How is it that they're all going to get this wrong? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I mean, I've been a Fed watcher for 50 years, um, going back to when I entered this business in 73. And every single uh, Fed regime has made some of these same mistakes. Um, you would think they'd learn, and Greenspan actually tried. I think there was a period of time when he would he would zig and zag ahead, knowing there was lags. He would kind of do it early, and as a result, he got elongated uh, an elongated cycle by doing that. You know, he took some of the took some of the pressure off the pressure cooker before it really blew, and then it, it kept it going. But you know, unfortunately, I think, in fairness to the Fed officials. This is uncharted territory, and they're trying. I, I get in trouble on Twitter because I defend Powell. I, I'm very critical, maybe he was his big, biggest critic through the years uh, for a lot of things. But then when people start calling him names, I go, he's a very smart man. He's not a trained economist, but even our trained economists are not making the calls right. And frankly, Wall Street's been cheering on these moves. So how can you how can you fault them when it's really it's basically institutional? <laughs> um, it, I, I really feel that some of this is because it is unprecedented. We um, I'm not I'm not unique or alone in seeing this, but you know the majority I think are not really understanding how how this is an unprecedented period. 
And, you know, you can also say that, look, eventually the can gets kicked to the end of the road and eventually it's the end of the road, considering we've been leveraging the system with, with debt for so many years. Uh, yeah, but yeah, to be fair, Powell is in a very difficult position. I will say he has good care, good hair. I'll give him that much. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, he, that. He's, he's done a remarkable job in, you know, if you remember back when he was saying we're on autopilot and he got in 2018 and he got massacred. It was a stupid thing. He was he was new to the position and he made some big mistakes. He's learned he's learned a lot. I think his messaging is so much better. But, you know, he's still making mistakes like listening to Bill Dudley. <laughs> I mean, so um, so, they're, we have, they're just, so we have these central banks that are going to make these mistakes, as we said, with excessive, extraordinary amounts of leverage. Describe what this uh, global deflationary bust looks like. What does that mean? What does it mean for markets? What does it mean for the economy? Paint me that picture. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked because the bust is another term like melt up that's being thrown around a lot these days. And frankly, if you ask people to define it after they use that term, I think a lot of them would not define it anywhere near what I mean by bust. I define a bust as something bigger than a recession, not the length of a depression. It's probably pretty much encapsulated in a 12 to 18 month time period like a recession is, but it will feel like a depression because you'll see a lot of major bank failures around the world. Less so in the U.S. because of what we went through in 2008-9. You know, our banks have some religion. They're less leveraged. Europe's in trouble. Canada's in trouble. Banks are more leveraged. So I think you're going to see more outside this country this time in terms of the banking crisis. But, of course, we just saw the regional banks are fragile in, in different ways. So I, I do think that there's the potential for something quite a bit bigger than 2008-9 in terms of a financial crisis. Um, All right. So, so let's get into the specifics here. What are your targets during this bust phase? What, what do the markets do? How low do the markets go? And by markets, we'll go with S&P 500. Sure. Yeah, I don't have a number because I don't know where the upside is, but I do have a percentage. And my, yeah. my view is it could be up to 80%. So we had a we had a 90% bear market in 1929. I believe we the Nasdaq fell close to that. Um, I can't remember what the exact numbers were. It was over 70 um, in 2000, you know, one, two, three. Um, so, um, you know, it's it seems un, unrealistic or unbelievable to say 80% peak to trough, but that's the potential. Am I, do I know it's going to be that big? No, but I think it's going to be, um, you know, somewhere in that 60, 70, 80 percent range. And I actually think 80 is, is a legitimate number. What does this look like in terms of economic growth? What would U.S. GDP be doing during this phase? Yeah, it's it's so hard to know because of some of these things with um, you know, our economy and, and jobs and everything. I think there's potential still for, in spite of what looks like a tight job market, once this thing starts going south, um, I think you're going to see a lot of layoffs. And I think there's potential for double-digit unemployment. Um, I think there's potential for um, double-digit negative GDP for a quarter or two. Um, and, you know, it's try to put that together with, you know, a, a financial crisis. What I what I think is the big the big scenario that I think could happen is that you could have banking failures domino dominoing across the world all in a short period, similar to what we saw with Silicon Valley, except in a much larger fashion with much larger institutions. And so you're looking at central banks who will be deer in headlights, having not seen this before. I mean, they had a little bit of a uh, uh, a learning experience in 2020, having to move pretty fast. And as I say, you know, governments aren't designed to move quickly for that kind of event. Once banks start failing, they fail fast. The only thing that can respond to that is money. You will see. I think the Fed's balance sheet will grow to 30 trillion or larger, and and similar proportionally around the world in the central banks. 
you know, again, these are unheard of numbers. But I think it's because we're going to be looking at something in uh, proportionally that we've never seen before. Let's unpack that banking collapse a little bit further. So you're saying that uh, we're going to see a domino-like effect in banks, and I'll keep it on to focused on the U.S. for now. I mean, we have what? We have like about two dozen regional banks that are expected to be on shaky ground at the moment. How many banks do you see collapsing by the time this bust period is over. How are we, we've had guests on the show that anticipate a consolidation of the banking sector, with the U.S. having between six to eight, maybe 10 banks remaining. What, what's your outlook? That's certainly not going to happen in, in one cycle or anything like that. And, uh, but I do see, I, you know, I don't know what the numbers will be, but I think they're going to be large. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, what we saw um, this spring was a shot across the bow and a warning sign, but both regionally and even the big banks, because of counterparty risk, et cetera, I can't rule out that one of our banks, big banks, could fail. I think, you know, overseas is much greater risk of failures. But, um, I, you know, I, I'm sure they're going to do everything they can to put these things together. Um, they'll technically fail, just like in 2008. They'll technically, we had lots of bank failures that didn't, you know, didn't go over under because they found ways to kind of hold them together. And I think we'll see that again as much as possible. Um, but it's, you're going to see, I think, an awful lot of banks and financial institutions. I mean, we have, we know the office buildings um, situation, yeah. uh, you know, office real estate, we uh, commercial real estate, we know, um, Retail's in trouble. We we know um, that um, you know the bond the bond portfolios will get benefit from you know the declining rates, but but it's government rates are going to decline. Um, corporate rates are you know spreads are going to widen dramatically if this scenario is anywhere near accurate. So so you've got that issue. Who knows you know. Where it comes out, and one area where I don't think people are focused very much is private equity, you know, pension funds, uh, public pension funds in particular, but also endowments and private pensions mm -hmm. have used um, private equity as a way to get away from some of the equity market volatility, thinking it's lower risk or diversified. You know, what is private equity? It, you know, in in my olden days, you know, back in the eighties. That was leverage buyout, right? And they changed the name. So, I mean, there's huge leverage in that area. You go into this kind of a downturn, leverage is something that eats you up. So, you got private equity issues, you've got pension fund issues, you've got um, you know a, a wealth effect that's going to be hugely negative if the market does what I'm talking about. So, I mean, putting it all together, it's very hard to have any kind of a solid forecast of numbers. But uh, all I can say is I think it's going to be something quite a bit worse than 2008-9. Yeah. We, we, we went to the edge of the cliff in 2008-9, but we're pulled back before we had a bust. The bust is when you go over that cliff. You know, if, if the commercial market had been allowed to freeze up, um, if, you know, if the banks had failed and couldn't be bailed, um, you know, we would have seen that bust then. But Fortunately, the policymakers reacted in time. This time around, I don't. I don't think they're going to have the ability to react in time. Um, and you know, the system will be saved because of all that money. Um, you know, I'm not saying this is the end. I know there are there are other strategies out there, and uh, people who want to talk about a long depression uh, following this cycle. You know what? Where I where I'm different than them is I think because of deflation, we have unlimited ability to print money this time around, um, and that gives us the ability to have one more recovery cycle, and then maybe in the 2030s we haven't talked about this, Michelle, but in the 2030s I think we can have a collapse of the system, because then you'll have not to jump ahead, but then we'll have high inflation, and no ability to print our way out of it. So. 
All right, um, all right. Before we get to 2030, and because we've got a commodity super cycle somewhere in between there again, so I want to break down these phases in, in a little bit more detail. And, and by the way, this idea of highlighting the risk of private credit and spreads really widening and a massive liquidity crunch, uh, Mike Green has recently called that, and he's the guy that um, was very well known for calling a Volmageddon in, I, I believe it was, um, in, in February of 2018. And at that time, what, there was a, a trade put that he made in one day that was like a quarter of a billion dollars. So that guy knows what he's talking about. And he's sharing a very a similar, very similar sentiment as you there. In, in this bust phase, which you say is going to be, as we discussed, pretty ugly, what does gold do? Uh, during the bust, I think... Um probably gets hit. And so let's say we get to my 3000 prior to the bust. I wouldn't be surprised if we're back at these levels again, um, you know, 1900, 2000 in the bust. Obviously, that will far outperform the equities if I'm right about an 88% equity decline. Um, so it will be setting up for being a, a better asset going forward. But I don't think very many assets are going to be able to escape a deflationary bust. So it will be hit, and silver will be hit harder than than gold because of its economic sensitivity. So, so silver, let's say silver gets to sixty pre-bust. You know, silver could go back to you know the uh, twenty area or twenty 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 five area certainly, and probably below that. You know, might even get into the teens. Um, so they'll be hit, um, but. What comes after the bust is going to be huge. Uh, All right, but where, where, where does one seek shelter during the bust then? Okay, so during the bust, I think there are two places. Um, one is treasury, well, three places. Treasuries, cash, um, and you got to kind of pick your spots you know, obviously FDIC insured accounts. I'm, I'm not at all worried that the FDIC won't, back, uh, won't be able to back its insurance. The government will fund to whatever extent is necessary to, to back the insured accounts. What we saw with Silicon Valley is we may see the government will back most bank accounts, but we don't know that yet. So, so certainly insured, insured savings, um, treasuries, uh, I believe, because as you said before, I'm looking for a 0% tenure. And if I'm right about $20 trillion going into uh, – uh, you know, expansion in the balance sheet, Fed's balance sheet, you could actually see negative, a negative tenure. Hmm. You're going to certainly, you're certainly going to see negative rates on the short end, but I think it could carry all the way out to tenure. The 30 year, I think, is going to stay positive. But, but either way, if rates where they are now, if, if you go from a, you know, 380, 390 tenure and go down to zero or below, obviously that's a huge return. So, so you can protect yourself in government guaranteed bonds. I would say at the very highest end, you know, U.S. Treasuries, um, in terms of where you feel you're going to protect yourself, um, and and the dollar. Surprisingly, I'm I'm quite bearish on the dollar for the balance of this year. I'm calling for eighty on the dollar on DXY, um, but from there. I think in the bust, and it's a huge, you know, that's a big move in a short time. But in the bust, I think we can take it from 80 back up to 120 or higher um, because I think the dollar will be a flight safety trade around the world. I mean, I think we haven't lost that yet. Perceived safety, <laughs> perceived flight right, to safety yeah, trade. Yeah. I mean, I, because I know I'm your describing... longer term outlook is, is not they, that great. The only reason it's safety, I guess, is because we have not yet blown up our system. I think we're, you know, what's going to happen here is going to lead to blow up, but it's, you know, oh. we still will have the printing press. Okay, so let's so let's recap this. As you said, we're probably going to have this massive parabolic melt up more or less until October. Again, not holding you to specific timelines and certainly applaud anyone that has the nerve and the gumption to come on and give specifics. But then we're going to have this major bust, which we've just described, is going to be pretty damn awful. And that's going to last for about 18 months. Yeah, I'd say it may even be over by the end of 24, but certainly by mid-25. Um, and again, the economy will probably be, be um, or the stock market will probably be out of it before the economy. So the economy might, 
you know, the downturn may linger into 2025. I would think the bottom in the stock market might happen within 2024. Okay. Um, you know, it, it typically a market leads, as you know. So, um, and and that describes. I mean, if we have an 80 percent decline. Uh, it's probably not going to be in one fell swoop. You're not going to go from peak to trough in one move. You'll probably have a move down, a big move down, you know, 40 or 50 percent, uh, a big bear market rally that lasts a couple months, and then another leg down that takes you all the way down. So, all right. Okay, so so got it between 12 to 18 months with, with the market, the leading indicator there. So, David, the big question, what does turn it around then? Is it the Fed coming in with excessive stimulus again. How does this get turned around? How do we get out of this bust? Yeah, it's, it's essentially, keep in mind, the likelihood is whatever we have as an expansion in the balance sheet is is matched by expansion in the government. So there'll be, you know, if I'm talking 20 trillion plus in monetary expansion, I'm talking 20 trillion plus in government expansion, meaning, you know, there'll be floating debt. The monetization of that debt is really the money, the QE, the money going in. So with a lag, and that lag's probably six to nine months to begin with, and you know the big big moves will show after that. Um, with a lag, you'll get the recovery. And but the problem is that recovery initially you're coming out of deflation, so initially. The recovery is, um, you know, the the rise up in in interest rates and inflation is very slow coming out of deflation. Your first year, you're going to have still low rates, low inflation. But as, uh, with that kind of money, you're going to have a huge effect on interest rates and inflation, or on inflation and then interest rates as we move through twenty six, seven, eight, nine. So I believe. I believe we will exceed the 1980s, early 80s interest rates and inflation uh, by the end of this decade. So, you know, you may start at zero, one, two, three percent in the first year out of the the uh, bust. You might go to, you know, five, six, seven, eight in the second year, and then you're at double digits by the third year out of the bust and accelerating from there. I would not be surprised to see 25 percent inflation by by the end of the decade and um, long bond, you know, upwards 15% was our peak last cycle. I mean, uh, back in the 1980s, I expect it to be well exceeded this time, maybe 17, 18 or higher. So how do you, the, the big question I always ask myself that I can't answer, and it doesn't, certainly doesn't come with a good answer, is how do we fund our deficits? How do we fund our, our debt? When interest rates are high double digit, we can't fund them when interest rates are three, four, five percent. It will eat up our budget and then some. So, um, you know, again, I may be wrong in the timing. It may take longer to build or it may build more gradually. But ultimately, we get into trouble pretty quickly. They will, the, the government will try, no doubt, they will try to um, issue debt to cover service, you know, to, to help cover service costs. So as the servicing costs are going up, as, you know, we service our debt, they're going to sell more bonds because they want to they want to meet their other obligations too. But that ends very quickly. It becomes you're pouring gasoline on an inflationary fire and pouring more on, you know, within a couple of years, you, you, you're out of that game. You can't do that anymore. Then it becomes how do we fund our debt? So, so that's why the, the next cycle is likely to be short. You know, if it starts in 2025 and ends by 2030, as compared to the one that started in 2009 and, and is still going, um, you know, it, that's a short cycle. But commodity cycles are typically short. Um, OK, so let's talk this uh, into specifics again. So you say 25 percent inflation by 2030, right? Um, that's and, the that's the potential. Certainly, twenty, and it could be twenty five. Yeah, that's <laughs> double digit inflation by the end of twenty thirty, and coming out of this bust, we're going to have this commodity super cycle. I know you have some pretty high estimates for gold and silver by the end of the decade through this commodity super cycle. So, talk us through those. 
Sure. So the, the thesis, just so people understand, when the, the thing that will drive the next cycle, every cycle is led by new things or different things. So we've had, we've had this long tech cycle. Um, and I think we are going to see next cycle. The consumer obviously is going to get beat up pretty badly if we have an 80% bear market and and all the other things going on, jobs and you know the economy down, et cetera. Housing probably loses 30% from the peak at least. Um, so, so I think consumers are going to be digging out for a while coming out of this bus. What we'll see is the next cycle is going to be driven by industrial. So we haven't had an, an you know an industrial driven economy for a while. Some of it's reshoring. We're obviously doing that now. I think that will accelerate. Some of it is infrastructure, certainly, um, and we'll see that. Obviously, alternative energy and electric cars, et cetera, will will be part of it. Um, but around the world, what we're going to see is an industrial driven economy and that demands an awful lot of commodities and we've we're kind of in a perfect storm where commodities have you know we had a service economy um cycle for for more than one cycle here for several cycles this disinflation has been really geared towards the consumer if you switch the other way what we've seen is we've really limited our search for metals search for commodities we're going to have a, a supply demand imbalance that's huge, and then couple that with this massive monetary infusion that leads to this, you know, kind of um, overheated economy on the industrial side, and and it's a perfect storm for a huge pop in in commodity prices. So yes, I have uh, uh, you know my my targets for gold and silver by the end of the decade, or certainly close to that, you know, early. Uh, say 2030, 20, 2029, 2030, I think you could see gold as high as 20,000. I think you could see silver as high as four or 500. So those are obviously huge multiples yeah. uh, of where we are today. Um, and I also have oil going to $500 a barrel. Um, probably see copper. I don't have a number for copper, but it'll be many, many times this cycle's peak. And I think we see copper go to $6 this year. So many times that, um, you know, when you start adding these up, natural gas will go through the roof. Uh, when you start adding these up, you go, how, how do we afford it? How, you know, how, what's the cost of living and how, how does an economy function under that? And I don't have an answer for you. It's why I think it, you know, these excesses will bring an end to it pretty quickly. Okay, so to recap, gold to 20,000 by the end of the decade, silver 400 to 500 by the end of the decade, oil about the same 400 to 500 by the end of the decade. In terms of, and copper to soar, in terms of the industrial demand, I get that we're going to have precious metals rally on this inflation. And I certainly get the idea that we haven't invested enough in, in mining to make sure we have all of the materials that we need because it hasn't been uh, something that's been attracting capital. But where is the industrial demand going to come from? Which economies, which sectors of the globe, what would be driving the commodity super cycle on the industrial side? Yeah, I think certainly here um, it's reshoring. You know, like I said, it's reshoring. It's also this move away from fossil fuels. Will that'll be continuing uh, in terms of you know having to build things? It's building new semiconductor plants or you know things like that. So we we really haven't had an industrial um, economy here for so long. Um, I think we'll bring steel back into this country, um, and then of course. Um, I think you'll see some of the same trends around the world. I, I presume China will continue with its Belt and Road uh, efforts and you know try to compete in various parts of the world, South America in particular, uh, and trying to build out uh, some of the things there for them. Um, so there's going to be, I think, not just a U.S.-driven industrial recovery. I think it will be industrial around the world. I think the consumer is going to take a back seat this time around. We're, you know. We're, we're not unique. We're seeing similar things around the world. Obviously, Europe, their consumers are going to be in tough shape. Um, they've got a lot of needs in terms of their energy infrastructure. 
Um, so I, I think you're going to see it around the world. You know, China's a wild card. I I don't know because they are. You know, if we're leveraged, they're multi. You know, they're hyper leveraged. Um, so I don't know how they come through this bus. But my presumption is that they're they're going to come through this. I, I use the analogy of um, coming out of '87. Um, you know, Japan and the U.S. went into '87. They came out of '87. Japan peaked out in in '89 and has been down ever since, or certainly, you know, uh, lost its its leadership there. And the U.S. And the U.S. market soared. Obviously, went up many fold while Japan went down. Japan markets went down. I think. You could say we are coming out of the bust. We are Japan, and China is is us. So uh, I don't I don't know that because again, how does China handle this bust? I'm not sure, but because they've got they've got excesses in big ways, and in, in obviously in real estate and in a lot of areas. So it's not a given that they come out of this the leader. Okay. Uh, that's another thought to unpack, particularly as we discuss the trend of de-dollarization and potential threat from China. But before we get there and before we go post-2030, or at least touch more on 2030 as you have it, what could potentially derail your thesis? What could happen that changes this whole thing? Yeah, I, I mean, if, if, if I, I view it as pretty inevitable because mm. I think we are, what we see in a super cycle is that each each cycle, you build more excesses. So you get bigger ups and bigger downs. You know, you had 73, 74 was, a, was the biggest cycle in post-World War uh, era to that date. And we had a double dip recession in, in the early 80s and inflation went through the roof. Then we went through this long disinflation period but we built excesses in the financial area in, in terms of leverage, et cetera. And we're coming, you know, and then we had 2008-9. Um, and I just think what we're seeing here is a culmination of uh, what I call is basically a giant Ponzi scheme that's coming going to come apart. You know, I, I view it as inevitable. Can, can we somehow uh, kick the can down the road again? My only reason for doubting that is is that what it's going to take to bail us out of this, you know, call it a bust or just a severe downturn and financial crisis? It's going to take even more money, and and then you you know you'll be jump starting to a higher inflation. Now, could I be more too extreme on my inflation call or too extreme on on commodity call, et cetera? I could be. I you know, I don't think I am, but I could be, and that might just lengthen things. But I don't. I don't really see a way out of this because of the excesses that have built over, you know, eighty or ninety years. Yeah. And 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 have accelerated over the last twenty. So a giant Ponzi scheme that will come to an end, and it is inevitable that this happens more or less within this time frame that you predict. What happens then, very quickly, as we're running out of time here, David? What happens post twenty thirty? Um, so post 2030, if you think about this and take it to its logical conclusion, there comes a time um, where our government loses, it, our treasury loses its access to the capital markets. I mean, when you when you describe um, the kind of servicing costs that come with that kind of um, high interest rate, and you look at you know the debt being ramped up from what's already ex very excessive. The, the calculation just doesn't add up. And so they have to come up with something to be able to fund the government and fund their debt at the same time. I don't know how they do it for very long. And so then you have to start cutting back services and cutting back military, cutting back everything. I, I think they are going to, you know, government bureaucrats, the one thing I can say, and that's why I call the bus the way I do, is they will never voluntarily let things blow up. They will do whatever they can in the present to try to kick the can down the road. The problem is when you get late in this decade, they don't have anywhere to go. I mean, if if we're denied the capital markets, think about that. All of a sudden, you you know, the only thing that's kept us going for all these years is we kept adding on to our debt, kept monetizing our debt. Um, 
So we had money. If it's if it's dependent on a closed system where you can't do that, you know, we're way past the ability to afford what we have. So so I think at some point, um, and again, I'm describing the U.S., but I think this is true around the world. We've reached that limitation, and what limits us is that we lose the printing press. If you have hyperinflation, you cannot print more money because it then leads to even more hyper, you know, even higher inflation, and it burns itself out very quickly. So um, I'm not saying they won't try, but I don't think they it can last very long. Where ultimately you lose access to the capital markets as a government, and you lose your printing press. And then you have to live within your means, and and you're you know you're in a very deficit, a big deficit situation. So it it comes to an end. Uh, I describe, and again I hate to say this, uh, because it is farther out, and I could be dead wrong, but I can see the potential for fifty percent plus unemployment because of a collapsing economy. And and again, this will be worldwide, but I'll describe ours with no welfare system, no unemployment, you know, limited if any Social Security or Medicare. How how does that add? A, I mean, that's that's a dire situation. But that's what you get if you get a collapse of the system. I mean, we're, that is that is dire indeed. And you know, David, some would say that that would then be the crisis that is used to usher in universal basic income in the form of a central bank digital currency in a CBDC, uh, which would then allow the government to program the currency and to, of course, monitor every single transaction. And that crisis scenario is what could lead to that. Thoughts on that? Yeah, my, my feeling is I, I, I do fear uh, a digital currency, a central bank digital currency. I do, I do believe that they want to do that. Um, and I do believe they want to do it much sooner. I think the bus postpones anything if they had designed on because I know there are people out there saying they're, you know, it's coming soon. If they have designs on that happening soon, I think the bus just postpones that they're going to have much bigger fish to fry. Um, and, and then they're going to have, you know, all they can handle in terms of trying to fund their government um, for, for this decade. And frankly, if we get to the situation I described for the 2030s, I don't know how digital currency even comes into it because, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. What I say when people say, well, what, what comes of that? What comes after that or during that? I go, it's a vacuum. It could be filled by totalitarianism. You know, it's, I don't think it's something that ends well. I th it's, the, it's the end of the system we know. Uh, and I'm talking about worldwide, you know, the Western capitalistic system. I don't know what fills that. We do know there's, I mean, you know, Klaus Schwab and and certainly lots of other evidence out there. We do know there's a new world order agenda out there. And we're seeing a lot of it through our own government uh, that they're seemingly greasing the skids for that. Um, you know, they may want a one world government. They want may want to, you know, um, take down sovereignty and and all of that. That may be what fills a void, but they're not going to have an easy time of anything because the world's going to be a mess. That is a very, very dark, depressing, bleak picture that you're painting for 2030, David. Um, but yeah, I mean, many speculate that this is exactly the crisis that engineers this great reset, this uh, global one world currency. We're going to have to bring you on to unpack that even further, but very, very quickly, David, as an investor, if this does play out, is there anything you can do to protect against the 2030 scenario? I, you've given us your calls of things along the way, but what can you do if uh, you think 2030 is going to play out as you say it will? How do you protect yourself? Tell people, after, after I've scared the bejesus out of people, I always say, just remember, it's that's a long-term forecast that could be dead wrong. Um, I I don't put it out there lightly, but um, I tell everybody um, focus on now, focus on you know the melt up, the bust, and what I think is going to be a huge opportunity in commodities, and get your house in order. You have basically the balance of this decade to do the right things and get your your house in order. Uh, I think that's all we any of us can do. 
um, because I don't I don't have answers for how how to handle the 30s if it comes anywhere close to what I'm describing. Um, there may be answers that come along the way, but right now all I can say is focus focus near term. Don't focus out there because that, you know you'll you'll needlessly lose sleep over something you can't control. <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely going to be losing quite a bit of sleep after this interview, but I will, oh, take no. <laughs> your, I will take your advice and focus on the now. Thank you so much, David. We're going to have to wrap it up now, but would love to have you back to continue this discussion and break down some more of the points that you highlighted along the way here. Certainly want to get your thoughts on the long-term outlook for the dollar, but we're out of time for right now. Thank you for sharing your focus and expertise with us. Really appreciate it, David Hunter. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a pleasure. All right. And as always, thank you for watching. A special thanks to our sponsor, Prime XBT. From me, Michelle McCory, and the rest of the team, we'll see you soon. Begin your path to financial freedom. Gain up to a $7,000 bonus on us. Register and use promo code. Deposit and enjoy a 7% bonus. Available now. Link in the description.